Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Ashland Public Library. <laughs> My name is Mina Jane. I'm the director of the library. You are, we're so happy that you're here. And um, uh, silence your cell phones. Tom Wessels is amazing. Um, I did this introduction a minute ago, so that's why I'm kind of rushing through it. But um, also, this is our owl. I didn't say this before. This is a, allowing people at home to also watch this program. We will be recording it and sending out a recap to everybody who attended and registered. So welcome. I'm handing it over to Kathy, to the John Forest Committee, and um, just enjoy the show. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, for those of you who are sponsors in the audience, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I wanna say uh, thanks to the Ashland Town Forest Committee, the Ashland Public Library and Friends of the Library and the library staff for their assistance hosting and sponsoring this lecture. Welcome to the Terrestrial Ecologist and founder and Professor Emery at the Antioch University of New England where he found a master's degree program in conservation biology. His interests in forest, desert, art, and alpine ecosystems, plus geomorphology, evolutionary ecology, and complex system science, and the interface of landscape and culture. Tom considers himself a generalist. He has conducted workshops on ecology and sustainability throughout the country over the, for the three decades. He is the author of numerous books that are related to the of fire and fog, the natural and cultural history of Acadia. Organizing principle that has allowed life to exist on this planet for 3.8 billion years is co-evolution, a process that creates an incredible complex web of mutually beneficial relationships. This talk will explore how co-evolution works using lots of examples of the current nature of the model for creating human systems that not only sustain themselves but thrive well. I first heard Tom Wells to speak shortly after the publication of Reading Course of Landscape, and I have heard him a couple of times since then. Amount of information synthesized in various disciplines and specialized subjects are impressive and will be wishing for more. Please help me welcome Tom Bussell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know, is this working? Do I need to? All right. Well, I'll, I guess I'll use it since it's here. Um, so I'm going to talk about three scientific concepts. Second law of thermodynamics, I'm going to start with, then we get into the principle of self organization, and then into co evolution. Co evolution is a self organizing process, and then that will set the foundation to start looking at you know, human systems and how we can do a better job of structuring ourselves to be a more sustainable um, culture, I guess I would say. So, to start, I want to start with the, the laws of thermodynamics. There's two major laws. The first law is the law of conservation of energy, and it states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's a pretty powerful idea. It means all the energy in the universe today is exactly what it was back almost 14 billion years ago when this all got started. None has been created, none has been destroyed. Um, but from a sustainability perspective, it's the second law of thermodynamics, the law of transformation of energy that is much more important to look at. That law states that although we cannot create nor destroy energy, we can transform it from one form to another, to another. So right now outside, um, the new leaves that are emerging are capturing light from the sun. And in the process of photosynthesis, they're transforming that light energy into chemical bond energy. So there's one transformation right there. Um, I know that up in New Hampshire, where we live, uh, we have a wood stove to heat the house. So I can take that chemical bond energy in the wood and transform it into heat energy by burning it. Um, so there's just two transformations that happen right there. No energy is created or nor, nor, nor any destroyed, but we've transformed it. But the critical thing about the second law is that whenever a transformation occurs, it can never be 100% efficient. That means during the transformation, there's always a loss of energy from the system where that transformation is occurring. And that has really big implications. So for an energetic, uh, uh, let's say uh, system that can take in and give off energy, an open system, it can be in one of three energetic states. Um, if the system's taking in more energy, then it's releasing from its transformations. That's what's called a negentropic or anti-entropic system. 
And that's a system that grows because all that energy coming in is being stored in the growth of the system. So um, when we were children, uh, we were all anti-entropic systems. We were taking in more energy via food calories than we were releasing as heat from our bodies, from our metabolism. Um, then when a system reaches maturity, it becomes a dynamic equilibrium system. That means the amount of energy coming in is equal to the amount being given off. And that's what happens when we reach adulthood. Uh, healthy adults, you know, take in about 2,000 kilocalories of energy a day in food and give off about 2,000 kilocalories of heat and growth stops. But it's the third state I want, want to really focus on. That's a state where the system is taking in less energy than it's losing from its transformations. And that's what's called an entropic system. And entropic systems are often said as they're losing energy to move from a state of uh, order towards disorder. And yet those are very subjective ideas, order and disorder. Um, I used to, many, many years ago, be the dorm head of a secondary school girls dorm. And um, I can assure you, we, I do Sunday inspections, room inspections, to try to help the girls keep the room sort of orderly. And their idea of order and my idea of order was very, very different. So um, <laughs> just saying that's a very subjective way to look at it. A much more objective way to look at entropy is entropic systems is they're losing energy, always move from a state of complexity to a state of simplicity. And they always move from a state of concentration of energy and materials to diffusion of energy and materials. So imagine um, a tree being knocked over by a windstorm, it uproots, it's dead, it's now an entropic system. And as decomposers move into that tree and start decomposing it, it's complex molecules like cellulose and lignin get broken down to very simple molecules of carbon dioxide and water that just diffuse out into the air. And after many, many decades, that complex structure of that tree will be completely reduced to just simple atom, I mean, molecules of carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen gas, and simple inorganic molecules that diffuse into the soil and the tree is gone. So entropy is a process that always moves from complexity towards simplicity and concentration of energy materials to diffusion of energy materials. Now, Catherine mentioned that life's been on this planet for 3.8 billion years. That is a really long time. It's a very hard time to sort of grasp a number like that. So I'm going to give you a way to sort of get an idea of how long that is. Imagine the thickness of a standard sheet of paper representing a century. Uh, the question is, how tall a stack would we need each sheet representing a century to equal 3.8 billion years? And the answer is we'd need a stack of paper over three miles in height. That is an incredible amount of sheets of paper. That's how long 3.8 billion years is. So for the first 3.5 billion years, the biosphere on this planet was an anti-entropic system. It was capturing more energy through solar gain than was bleeding off its heat from all the, the transformations uh, within all of its organisms. And as a result, uh, the biomass on this planet was built up, a lot of it buried underground in you know, coal beds and oil reserves and things like that. And we built up an atmosphere that had no oxygen in it to having 21% oxygen, This oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis. Then around 300 million years ago, the biosphere became a dynamic equilibrium system. We know that because oxygen levels have remained quite constant around 21% over the last 300 million years. But for the, <clears throat> the first time in this planet's history, due to the energy transformations of just one species, and that's us human beings, uh, the earth is now an entropic system and it's getting more entropic every year we move forward. Uh, pretty much every environmental problem we are witnessing today is a problem of entropy. Um, over harvesting of the ocean's fisheries and simplifying the ocean's ecosystems is an entropic process. Uh, right now, removal of primary, primary tropical rainforest in the Amazon basin to make way for sugarcane and soybean plantations is an entropic process. We're taking incredibly complex ecosystems and replacing them with simplified monocultures. Uh, the burning of fossil fuels is an entropic process. We're taking concentrated stores of carbon 
and diffusing it out as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So um, these are all examples of the entropy that's taking place in the planet. And like I said, it's happening at increasing rates every single year. And of course, we cannot continue on that <clears throat> trajectory because eventually um, the entropy will get to the point where it will create a feedback loop that will basically curtail our activities to continue to produce that entropy. It's not a question of if that will happen, it's just a question of when that will happen. So the, the second law is sort of like the foundational sort of grounding scientific footing for why what we're doing right now, our trajectory is not sustainable at all and will eventually fail us. So we've got to figure out ways to really restructure how we do things. We gotta become energy frugal. And you know, it's interesting, frugality and you know that word used to be a pretty common in the American uh, vernacular. You hardly hear frugality anymore. It's something that sort of we've, we've lost and yet we're gonna have to be that way. We're gonna have to really dramatically decrease the amount of energy we utilize um, to turn around the entropic cost of using so much. Um, so <clears throat> with that, I'd like to now move to self-organization and coevolution because they act as wonderful models of how we can restructure how we do things uh, to be a much, much more, more sustainable sort of entity. So um, for about the last 400 years, uh, Western science has been very much enmeshed in linear reductionism as a paradigm. Uh, this was very much started by Rene Descartes back in the 1600s. Descartes was enamored, enamored with machines of his age, things like water mills and windmills and wind-up clocks, machines that had parts that moved. And he started seeing everything in the world being very mechanical. Uh, even organisms like our, ourselves, he thought, well, we're really no different than machines. And he said, if you really want to understand how something you know, works, you take it apart. That's the reductionism, is reducing it down to its parts. And then you figure out the sequence in which the parts interact. And if you've done that, you've figured out the system because to Descartes, the sum of the parts equals the whole. Um, but as we moved into the late 1800s and early 1900s, there are a lot of people doing research in various disciplines, uh, disciplines like anthropology, sociology, psychology, biology. And they were finding that the linear reductionistic mode was not really helping them understand the subjects they were trying to study. And so right after World War II, some conferences were convened in New York City that brought researchers from a variety of different disciplines together just to talk to each other about what they were experiencing in their discipline. And interestingly enough, they all began to see, they were all seeing the exact same sorts of phenomena. For example, they were seeing emergent properties, things that you could not predict by just looking at how parts interacted. These were things that came out of the interrelationships that were greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, they were seeing uh, systems that could bifurcate, that could shift their mode of behavior very quickly. Um, they were seeing feedback loops. And so what this did, this brought about the development of a new branch of science called complex system science. At the time it was called chaos theory because uh, linear systems are very predictable. You know, you have a, 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 a wind up clock, you know, based on how many times the gears go around, you can predict exactly where the hands of the clock will be. But complex systems aren't predictable at any point in time. Uh, and that's why they're called chaotic because you couldn't predict like five minutes from now what the system was gonna be doing. Um, however, that, that, that term was sort of misnomer because if you go to large, uh, you know, sort of temporal scales, complex systems can, can be very, very conservative in their behavior. So you can't predict what they're doing at any point in time, but uh, we can predict that, you know, January is probably going to be the coldest month of the year and July is going to be the hottest. It happens like that pretty much every year. Um, so in any case, um, one of the principles that came about when scientists were working out the uh, various principles of complex system science was the principle of self-organization. And what self-organization is, it's a process that occurs in the anti-entropic phase of a complex system when it's growing. And if the, if the system self-organizes, it not only grows bigger, but it gets more complex. And that complexity is derived from the parts within the system becoming ever more specialized through time and becoming also tightly integrated in their interrelationships. 
such that each part doing what it needs to do for its own purposes, <clears throat> excuse me, creates conditions that supports the whole system. And as a result, through time, these complex systems that are self-organizing grow increasingly stable and increasingly resilient. So I'll go through that one more time. It's a process that as a system grows, it not only gets bigger, but gets more complex. The complexity is derived from the parts becoming ever more specialized through time, as well as becoming tightly integrated together, each part doing what it needs to do for its own purposes, creates conditions that supports the whole, and these systems grow increasingly stable and resilient. So this is a process we all went through in our developmental stages early in life. Uh, we all started life as a single microscopic cell, and yet today our bodies hold about 30 trillion of our own cells. Uh, I should mention we've got about 60 trillion other organisms living in us, like bacteria and things like that. But 30 trillion of the cells in our bodies is our, our own cells. And luckily for us, that one cell just didn't multiply to 30 trillion. The cells started differentiating and becoming specialized. So today we've got 254 different cell types in our bodies. But the specialization goes even further. Some nerve cells just communicate with a sensory cell. Some nerve cells just communicate with a muscle cell. Other neurons link sensory and motor neurons. Our cells are really specialized, but luckily for us, they're tightly integrated together. Each cell doing what it needs to do for its own purposes, creates conditions that support the whole. And as a result, our bodies are really stable. Our internal bodily environment, always right at 98.6, unless we're running a fever. Um, you know, blood pH held very carefully. Blood CO2 levels, blood sugar levels, everything very, very stable. And we're resilient. If we get uh, wounded or sick, we heal. So we're a great example of the process of self-organization that took place in our bodies uh, in our early, early stages of life. So what we're going to do is I'm going to look at this process now at the ecosystem level through evolutionary time, because coevolution is a self-organizing process. It works the exact same way that development in our body worked. Now, um, out in the natural world, uh, the, the bottom sort of solid currency is energy currency. And energy currency is, is, is rock solid stable. A kilocalorie of energy is always a kilocalorie. So, you know, energy currency is not like our currencies. It doesn't fluctuate, it's stable. But the critical thing is there's only so much out of there, out there of it. It's finite. It's, you know, energy is not infinite. There's only so much. So nature is always urging organisms to become more energy efficient. Because if an organism can develop a strategy, a behavior, an adaptation that makes it more energy efficient, it can support a larger population on the same finite amount of energy. So nature's always pushing in this way, and this is a major driver of this process of co-evolution. Now, um, ecologists like myself have been warning for a long time now that we shouldn't be moving species from one part of the world into another part of the world because when we do that, we, we create young ecological interactions where the species have had no chance to co-evolve together. And the result is those interactions are usually pretty negative uh, on, in terms of their impacts on one or more of the parties involved. So I'll give you just one example of this. In 1904, uh, the chestnut blight fungus was accidentally in introduced into the Bronx of New York on oriental chestnuts being planted at that time. Uh, people didn't know those chestnuts were basically um, you know, carrying the fungus because that fungus and those old world chestnuts had co-evolved for so long, it was a very, very mild form of parasitism and hardly noticeable on those trees. But the American chestnut and that fungus had never interacted before. And at that time, the American chestnut was probably one of the, the most common forest trees in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, in the heart of its range, places like Tennessee and Kentucky, pretty much one out of every three or four trees is an American chestnut. And these trees grew to immense sizes. Uh, it's hard to imagine in a deciduous temperate forest like the ones we have around here, trees of the stature that the American chestnut used to reach because we have pre blight photographs uh, of American chestnuts up to 14 feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. So um, 
that would be more than half the width of this room. If you can imagine trees of that size, it's just, you know, I guess in this room, we might be able to stuff in four big chestnut stumps, <laughs> you know. Um, it was the probably signature tree in the temperate deciduous forest, had the most edible nut of any tree in the temperate deciduous forest. It only took about 30 years for that fungus to escape out of the Bronx and almost completely eradicate the American chestnut. Um, now, I should say, I am confident the chestnut will eventually come back because if two species make it through their first contact without going extinct, coevolution kicks into gear and starts pushing them. Now, I'd like you to contemplate the fungus in this instance. Um, if you're a host specific parasite, the very worst thing you could do is eradicate your host species. Because if you've done that, you've just done in your whole population. And if you think about it, that was a really energy wasteful thing for that fungus to do. It would have been so much better off not to kill its host tree. It would have lived longer. It would reproduce more, there'd be more of a resource for its offspring. It did really just about the very worst thing you could do. Um, so here is an instance where this is a real detrimental thing to both parties. But like I said, if two species make it through that initial contact, coevolution kicks into gear and can push a relationship like this one, which is pretty much outright predation, all the way up to a um, obligatory mutualism where both species have to interact to survive and they both benefit. So a good example of this involves the bull's horn acacia tree. That's a tree you can find down in Central America. Uh, and it's resident uh, uh, Azteca acacia ant. Uh, these two species are so highly co-evolved that they're in an obligate mutualism. Now, during their tenure together, the uh, acacias developed three morphological features to support its ants. The first is the thorns that used to work, ward off herbivores have become big and swollen and pliable, and the ants drill into them and hollow them out, and that's where they, they raise their young. Secondly, on every leaflet tip is a little globule called a belchian body. The ants can go and harvest those. That's where they get their nutrition and they'll grow right back again. And then finally, on every leaf stem is an open nectary or sap well where the ants can go and drink sap and that's where they get their water and their sugar uh, carbohydrate energy resource. <coughs> the ants are so specialized to the acacia, they can only eat uh, Belgian bodies and acacia sap. They can't consume anything else. If they were removed from their tree and you put honey in front of them or sugar or whatever else they will, they'll perish. But in return, they give the acacia the most advanced plant defense system in the world. Um, they have a real venomous sting. So anything that tries to land on that acacia or come up to the acacia to munch on its leaves instantly gets swarmed and driven away. But not only that, if vines try to grow up the, the trunk of the acacia, the ants will come down and cut through the vines and kill them. If a surrounding tree tries to grow into the acacia space, the ants will go in that tree and defoliate it and kill it. So, um, you know, these two things have to exist together because if you remove the ants from their acacia tree, the acacia tree will be dead within about a month. Uh, if you remove the ants, they'll be dead within a day. Um, but what's marvelous about this interaction, we know from the mandibular structure of the ants that they are derived from leaf cutter ants. So way long ago, when the ancestral leaf cutter ant and the ancestral acacia first came into contact in a young ecological relationship, it probably wasn't a very pretty picture. Trees may have been being defoliated and killed, which was energy inefficient, and somehow coevolution kicked into gear and forced these species to become now these mutualistic partners. Um, and so you'll see that through that time, they become super specialized. Uh, in, in their ecological roles. Now, another example where we can see this process occurring of creating specialization happens uh, via interspecific competition, competition between members of different species. Competition uh, in an ecological uh, perspective is said to be a negative, negative interaction. Both individuals competing being harmed because they're losing energy in their competitive struggles they would be much better off if they could figure out ways to coexist without competing, they get an energy boost. So this happens through a process that's called niche separation. Um, a niche is sort of the total ecological role of an organism. And niche separation is for organisms to change their niches 
to remove the overlap that's creating the competition. So this can happen through what's called, for example, temporal separation, where species are active at different times. So owls at night, hawks during the day. And this can even happen in the plant world. So right, right now is a great time to go out in our calcium enriched forests here in New England, because if we do that, we're gonna see the understory is just gonna be carpeted in bright emerald green from the leaves of wild leeks and dustman's breeches and squirrel corn and trout lilies and spring beauties. All five of those vernal wildflowers are said to be vernal ephemerals because they grow up in April, they do all their photosynthesis in April into early May, and then when the canopy leaves come out, they die back down below ground, and then a whole second group of plants come, come up, the uh, you know blue cohosh and maidenhair fern and baneberry and things like that, and it makes our understories of our calcium enriched forest the most species rich in terms of herbaceous plants of any forest we have because we have these two groups that are temporally separating their niches so that they do not compete. Uh, another way this can happen is through what's called microhabitat separation, where species can be in the same habitat eating the same sorts of food items, but they specialize in where they're going to forage. So, for example, our black capped chickadees will forage on insects on twigs and branches, and our white breasted nuthatches can be feeding on the exact same tree at the same time, but they're specialized to forage just on the trunk. And in this way, they do not compete because they've separated out where they forage. And again, because of that, they're becoming more specialized in their ecological roles. Now, the last example I'd like to give uh, involves uh, let's say a wildflower meadow around here. And the question is, how many different species of insect pollinators do we have pollinating that meadow from this time of year when flowers are first coming into bloom all the way through into November when we still have asters and things like that in the bloom? And we know that it'll be well over 1,000 different insect species over the whole uh, blooming season that are working there. Uh, here in Massachusetts, we've got over 270 species just of bees that are pollinating. But then we've got all these butterflies and moths and flies and beetles and ants. And so, you know, well over a thousand species doing that job. And that builds up an incredible amount of what's called repetition of function. And in all the major functional roles we see out in the natural world, we don't have a handful of species doing them. We've got thousands of species doing them. So, um, I was doing a, a program down at the Oak Spring Foundation, uh, probably summer of 2019. And I had two arborists that were attending it from England. And over dinner one night, uh, they were telling me about their work and they mostly focus on pruning standing dead trees to keep them standing. I said, really, uh, why do you do that? And they said, well, we're not blessed with coarse woody debris like you have here in your forest. These standing dead trees are the refugia for our decomposing community. And the longer we keep them standing, the longer they serve as a refuge. Um, and they said studies in England have shown during the tenure of one dead tree, it can support 20,000 different species of decomposers. An incredible amount of biotic diversity just in one tree. Uh, so there you see, again, this incredible amount of repetition of function. Same thing with photosynthesis. We don't have a handful of plants doing it. We've got thousands of them. And this is what builds up the resiliency and the stability of the system. Because if any one species goes extinct, the system's fine because it has all these other ones doing the exact same role in slightly different specialized ways. Uh, they do the exact same thing. So the way this is sort of working, being driven by energy efficiency, coevolution is pushing species to become more specialized. As they become more specialized, their ecological roles or niches shrink, which means through time, ecosystems can support more and more and more species, building up that critical repetition of function and building up the resiliency and stability. So very much a self-organizational process. Um, so one way to think about this is that self-organization is a process that also decentralizes critical functional roles. 
Whenever we move in the opposite way towards centralizing critical roles, we're pushing the systems towards instability and lack of resiliency. So let me give one example of this. Um, the majority of uh, fruits, vegetables, and nuts grown in this country are grown in the Central Valley of California. Because of overuse of pesticides there and removal of uh, pretty much all native uh, plants, uh, pretty much all the pollinators have been extinguished. So we're down to just one species pollinating all those crops, and that's the honeybee. Now that is really a very unstable, very non-resilient system, because I think you all know the honeybees are not doing that well. And if you get real major hive collapse, the whole Central Valley will fold up overnight because uh, we've moved so far towards concentration of critical roles. Um, so is this making sense to people, this process? Okay, so I'd like to just shift using that last example more into human systems now. Um, my guess is that Western scientists were probably the last people to understand this principle of self-organization. I think uh, indigenous people had a good sense of it uh, and actually was even written about 200 years before Western scientists uncovered self-organization. It was actually written in a book published in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And if you know, if you don't know who Adam Smith is, he sort of considers the father of modern economic theory. Now, um, Smith was working in economies that were pre-industrial. These were merchant economies. And he would look at these economies and he was quite amazed. He'd be looking at like a village economy that had a butcher, a baker, a blacksmith, and a brewer. Uh, and without anyone orchestrating it, they were developing interrelationships that were mutually beneficial. He called this the uh, invisible hand of the economy. There's no one was orchestrating it. But, you know, the uh, butcher would buy knives from the blacksmith. The blacksmith would buy meat from the butcher. They were both supporting each other. Uh, even though their interest was in their own business, they were actually doing things to support other businesses. So they were integrated with other merchants, creating this more resilient system. Um, so, but if you look at that, that is a very self-organized model. You have these specialists integrated together in mutually beneficial ways. But if you look at our economy today, we have moved way far away from that. Um, I don't care what sector you examine, whether it's you know, pharmaceuticals, financial, energy, agriculture, uh, you know, media, retail, you're going to find that the bulk of the capital is going through uh, a handful of very large corporate entities. And these large corporate entities are not specialists. They tend to be generalists. So look at uh, an Amazon or a Walmart in the retail sector. They're selling everything. Uh, so here we have now concentration of critical functional roles in a few entities that are generalists, and they're not really interested in integrating with others in their sector <clears throat> to create beneficial interactions. They just assume dominate the sector if they could by competition, competitive exclusion, uh, mergers, acquisitions, whatever else. So our, our system has moved away from self-organization towards concentration or centralization of major roles. And we're starting to see the impacts of that. Um, we're, we're seeing it with supply chain dynamics that are not working. And I guess in China right now, they're getting really bad. And that's going to bubble over here pretty soon to make our supply chain dynamics uh, worsen quite a bit than they are right now. Mm -hmm. um, so at its core, uh, self-organization is a really good scientific uh, sort of support for the idea of relocalizing and re-regionalizing our economies to make them more resilient, to have many, many smaller more specialized businesses integrated in ways that they're supporting each other. Uh, it's a great scientific rationale for doing that, for moving away from the large sort of systems we have today that are fragile uh, because they're not self-organized. Um, so that being said, um, I'd like to give some more examples of, of how this works. Um, so, and I should say, I guess, before I do that, is the reason I think that we've, we've made this transition from the type of economic system Smith was looking at to what we have today is because of the advent of um, flexible, economically cheap energy resources in the form of electricity and petroleum. Is what that allowed was mechanization. 
Uh, in an economic system, uh, economic efficiency is basically measured by how much product or service you can produce per unit of human labor. But human labor is the highest cost of business. So if you can mechanize and decrease your workforce, you can dramatically increase economic productivity and also efficiency and profit. So by having these energy resources where you can mechanize, I think that's what shifted the dynamic. But once you go into mechanization, uh, you're becoming very energy inefficient in the way a business works. It's using lots and lots of energy. And it's not just the energy that's driving the machines, it's all the embedded energy in the machines. A lot of us don't understand embedded energy, but there's tons of it there. I mean, how much energy does it take to extract the materials, the raw resources out of the ground, uh, process them, build them into parts, build machines, ship the machines out, huge amounts of energy to go into that process. So let me just give an example of, of this. Uh, I'm gonna contrast two different businesses that sell hamburgers. <laughs> So um, over in Greenfield, Massachusetts, there is a brew pub called the People's Pint. It was started by one of my former students. He came to Antioch um, to study uh, <clears throat> solid waste management. But while he was there, um, he was very much into composting and growing organic vegetables and making beer. And a friend of his also made beer. And they were talking one night saying, you know, there's no place in Greenfield where people can really just gather socially uh, for a bite to eat and maybe have some beers. And so they decided they're going to start this people's pint, make it more like an old world pub where she'd become a community gathering spot. Um, so they've been very successful. Uh, many people have come to them and said, gee, could you start a, another people's pint over in North Adams or over here? And he says, no, 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 I'll help you. I'll, you can take my model and do it, but make your own. Have your own community place. You know, we don't want to franchise this. You know, make your own. Because he was very big on each community having their own place like this, not a, a, a franchise moving around. If you go there, uh, you'll see that pretty much all the food in the menu is locally sourced. And there's only one uh, beef entree. It's hamburgers or cheeseburgers. That's it. And that beef comes from a friend of Alden whose farm is about 10 miles from the People's Pint where he's growing um, basically organic grass-fed steers. Now, I just want to think about the amount of embedded energy, the meat that's going to, to the people's pint. Um, that farmer has a tractor that runs diesel fuel, so he can cut hay for forage for his livestock in the wintertime, and he can spread manure out in his pastures. Uh, he's put up fencing. There's embedded energy in the fencing that has to be you know, used to extract the materials, make the fencing. He's got a barn with electricity in it. There's some energy there. And then there's going to be energy in the processing of the meat and the driving it the 10 miles over the people's pint. So there's some embedded energy in that meat to get there. But I'd like you to contrast that with McDonald's, you know, another hamburger maker. Um, McDonald's uh, sources their steers from around the world. And the bulk of them are grain fed. And once you do that, you've pretty much already increased the embedded energy in those cows meat by tenfold, because now you have to use all that energy in growing the grains, having big, you know, cultivation equipment out there, using pesticides, using uh, fertilizers, all this other stuff. Uh, it really dramatically boosts the embedded energy. But not only that, the steers are then shipped, you know, hundreds, thousands of miles to slaughterhouses. After they're slaughtered, machines do all the work. They grind up the meat, they make the patties, they box the patties, they ship the patties into freezers. From there, those are taken out hundreds of miles, shipped out to distribution centers. And then from the distribution centers, they go to the outlets um, themselves. And so when it's all said and done, the McDonald's hamburger is gonna have about 20 times more embedded energy than those at the People's Pint. That means 20 times more entropic costs to the biosphere because of the large amount of mechanization and transportation that's being used in those systems. So again, if you can be smaller, more specialized, we don't need the mechanization, your markets are smaller, so you don't need all that transportation, you dramatically reduce the energy costs. Now I'm gonna give just one more example and then I guess we'll open it up for questions and then uh, we'll transition to heading out in the field 
to look at examples of coevolution out there. Um, but the last example I'll give is another one of my students lives in Brattleboro, Vermont, and after she graduated, she started uh, a time bank in Brattleboro, which I think today has somewhere between four to 500 members in it. Uh, so the way this works is it's a voluntary basis. You want to be involved, you say I'm going to be involved, and you offer to the time bank a specific skill that you have that you like to do and you're willing to do for free. So um, I enjoy, you know, cutting down trees and chopping up cordless. Let's say if I go into the time bank, that's the skill I'm going to give. So if I go into somebody's place and I fell a tree in their property and cut it up for cordwood and it takes me three hours, I can then tap into somebody else in the time bank and get three hours worth of work out of them. So maybe, you know, I have a project where I'm putting up sheetrock, but I'm really not good at mudding the uh, sheetrock. I get someone in for three hours to do that. Um, so what people are putting in, their specialized skill they're putting in is like their specialized niche. And of course, this is creating all these interrelationships that are building capacity in that community without any exchange of money. They're building up all these ability for people to help each other with things without having to pay money for it. But not only that, people that would not have otherwise probably interacted start interacting and building up relationship that way. And even if they have very different political views, they may not see each other as enemies because they're now seeing each other as being integrated in a community. So this is just another example of a self-organizational thing. It's really all about creating these networks of mutually beneficial interactions to build up resiliency and stability in community settings. Um, you know, often people will say here that, you know, the, the answer to our problems about sustainability is technology. Well, technology is certainly appropriate technology is an important tool we are going to use. But unless we really change our worldview and the way we structure our systems, they're not going to help us. They're not going to help us get there. We have to really restructure how we're doing things, how we see the world. And I think as far as sustainability is all about right relationship, uh, right relationship to the natural world, to our human community, even to ourselves through reflective practice. And so I guess I will just stop there and just open up for questions or comments. And after that, I guess we'll transition to heading out. But any question, comments people have at all? Yeah. There's an article in the paper recently on um, the cost of eating beef in terms of the rainforest mm -hmm. and the fact that when you eat that hamburger, you've taken down some of the rainforest because that's where a lot of that beef is coming from. Um, I'm wondering what can be done to make people more aware of the cost. I thought the thing was so interesting of the room pub and mm -hmm. McDonald's. How can people realize how damaging this is? It's, it's hard because, you know, um, I think we're getting into a, a culture and, and, and maybe this is a lot due to social media. I'm not sure where people are now getting information and sound bites. This stuff takes some time to explain and tease out. I mean, I, it's hard because we don't have a populace that is a lot of the populace that's interested in that. They, yeah. they don't they don't have the time. They don't, you know. So I I think it just has to be sort of modeled, not by talking about it so much, but by creating models where people can start to see, well, gee, that seems to be working over there. And then maybe they start to clue into this. I think just telling people if they're not searching already for different ways of looking at things, it's gonna be hard. It just we're just we're in a we're in a society right now where uh you know people get entrenched in their own ideas and uh often look at things and are and definitely are not versed in complexity because things become either black and white you know and there's nothing's like that <coughs> complex systems don't operate like that um so it's hard but you're right uh beef is a real problem it's not just because of that you know uh it's the safe, second major source of methane yeah. in the planet uh is coming from cows and uh you know, that caused a lot. So you're getting a double whammy in terms of um, global climate change because you're losing forests that can be carbon sinks and you're also pumping up all this methane. So it's a big, big issue. Yeah. I work in landscaping with uh, <laughs> um, and One of the things that, um, that I really try to do is like, that, you know, I'll, like I'll interview with a customer and they'll say, oh, I want a pollinator garden and I want this and I want that. And, 
and I'll be in there and I'm working away. And next thing I see a pest control, you know, mm -hmm. come up and it's like, you know, what do you? And originally way back, I would get really angry and be like, you know, I'll, but now I've, I'm, I've, I've more towards lean towards education because it's ignorance, not, you know, you know, people see a bee and they just like, you know, freak out and snakes and, you know, all that. And I have uh, this one and I try to figure out where they're coming from, their background. And I have this, uh, this customer from India and, and she's comes here and she's afraid of everything and she you know she freaks out and not pick it up and you know snakes and stuff and, and show her and she had a salamander in her house from a thing she brought in and you would have thought it was Godzilla um, <laughs> but showing her that you know it's in, in educating her and then she's now having her kids come out and touching the things with me and you know and she's comfortable and it's just I think education and uh and also not attacking somebody, what somebody's doing. When you say to somebody, you know, oh, do you know that this is what you're doing? It just, it's a big turn off, you know, instead of just offering alternatives. Like I love that, you know, what your examples. And I, I think, cause I mean, some of the stuff that we see, it's like, it is, it's mind bending, um, you know, and when you um, like really looking into soil regen right now and, and the, uh, What's happening when, you know, I, I know uh, heavy equipment, they strip and process the soil or depleting the soil, all of microbes, you know, everything that we need. Okay, how do we get people to go back and realize you don't have to stop the rainforest. You're, you, know, you need to focus on your backyard. You need to see what you are doing and what you can, and everybody makes their little difference will make a collective change. Yeah, very good. So when you talked about the tree and the ant um, and that co-evolution and the co-relationship, um, is that something that happens pretty quickly or does that take eons to sort of create? Well, some of these things can happen pretty quickly. Usually that happens when you're looking at microscopic organisms. They can create mutualisms pretty darn fast. There's getting into more, complex organisms it takes a lot more time so um how long i don't know but you know generally we're talking about millennia at least mm -hmm. and maybe millions of years but you know uh, so for example um i'm confident that pretty much all our trees currently suffering pathogens will probably be okay but it may take a thousand years for co-evolution to work these things out so as an example of that 5,000 years ago, Eastern Hemlock was throughout its current range in uh, Eastern North America. And then from 5,000 to 4,000 years ago, there's no pollen record of Hemlock being present at all. So we know that something happened to the Hemlock and completely took it out. Probably very similar to what happened to American Chestnut. But then about a after about 1,000 years, boom, Hemlock was back. So, um, you know, that's what I'm saying. These co-evolved interactions probably take millennia and mm -hmm. longer to get from mutualism, like with the ants and the acacia, probably quite a bit longer, would be my guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think going back to your comment, I think it's really pertinent the way you were uh, explaining that. Um, I remember I was uh, involved in the Switzer Foundation. We had a fellow working with vineyards out in California, and he came across this one vineyard owner who um, had a uh, barn owl nesting in his processing facility. It really upset him, this owl was in there. And he was trying to figure out how he's gonna get rid of this owl. And one day he comes to work and he finds a cough pellet on the footstep going into the door of the processing facility. And he looks closely at it and he sees it's full of fur and, and bones. And he, he, then he went to, to opt, ask a ornithologist about this, said, oh yeah, that's, that's just mouse, you know, carcasses that's what the owl's eating at night and he goes eating mice because mice were one of his biggest problems it's all of a sudden it's like huh gee maybe maybe i can use these <laughs> animals to help me out <laughs> and so he got someone over there and they said yeah let's put up a bunch of perches out all throughout your vineyards and we're going to put up nesting boxes out there and in, in a couple of years, he had something like uh, 20 pairs of nesty barn owls out there making huge inroads on his mice. So all of a sudden he thought, holy cow, working with nature is really profitable. <laughs> uh, and he said, he said to all his crew, if you can think of some way that we can work with nature that's gonna you know, help us, let me know. So someone said, well, you know, um, 
we're going to be putting this other section of the vineyard in that's sort of bowl shaped. I think we ought to put like clay at the bottom of that bowl so that when it rains, water will collect there. And then we can use that water in our irrigation of the vineyard. But not only that, since we use sulfur to fight fungi, if it rains, we always lose that sulfur. Well, it's going to run downhill and pool in there and it floats and we can skim it off and reuse it. Sure enough, they did that and that worked. So he started down the road and he started doing all these practices of just working with nature. Because if you do that and you don't fight it, you get great benefits. So uh, over in Orange Mass is the Seeds of Solidarity Farm uh, run by Ricky Barak. When he bought that property, it was the first property in the Mount Grace Land Trust that was going to go for farming. He said, you know, I've never seen anywhere in the world where the soil gets turned over every year. You know, why disturb the soil? Because if soil is left intact, it gets way, way more biologically diverse. It gets all these, you know, mycorrhizal fungi, it holds carbon, it holds moisture. Why disturb it? So he went right away into doing no-till growing of vegetables. And he's been doing that now for two decades. Uh, Soil scientists at the University of Massachusetts have been studying. They consider his soils the most productive soils in the state. He's getting huge amounts of produce off these soils. He's an orange. He's an orange mass. And they do have an open house once, I think, two or three times a year. But, you know, this is where they live. It's a small, you know, couple acre farm. And he doesn't want people there all the time. But he does open up for open houses. Um, but he's doing all of this without any farm machinery at all. It's just his kilocalories and human labor because he has no weed problems. And now he doesn't even have to bring in compost anymore because the soils are so rich. And so um, he's just basically planting seeds and harvesting and he can grow huge amounts of produce with just his, his human labor because he's letting nature do it all. So, yeah. So this, I love these examples, and I'm going to go back to you talking about technology and how we need technology, but we need smart technology or the right technology. And I feel like there's this giant gap between what you just described, which is technology, but in a different way, mm -hmm. and like where the world goes and what the world sees in terms of business and business applying technology. They're like siloed. How do you, in its relationships, like how do you start pulling those together? Yeah. Well, I think it's, that's what I'm saying. You know, I think that technology is a tool that we can use, but we really have to really restructure how we're in relationship. Uh, you know, our, our worldview is way off. I mean, we have, you know, we have these notions of control. Um, and so we try to control nature or whatever else, and it just ends up using huge amounts of energy and it's counterproductive. It's more or less no, not control. Let's just work with these natural systems. They, you know, they figured it all out. We don't, you know, we can't improve on it. Um, but it means really shifting the whole sort of worldview, and it also means, you know, what we do is not about profit. It's about sustainable human communities. That's that's really the sort of the thing we should really be focusing on, um, and healthy natural systems because if we have those, we'll do much better as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, your previous comments about um, you know tilling and, and soil disturbance just brought something to mind that I, I've read over the past couple of years. I've seen or seen certain articles that um, note that um, plants, in, as part of their normal growth uh, processes, um, actually take about half of their total photosynthetic product in terms of you know, complex carbohydrates and, and you know, consider it as energy into uh, root exudates, into complex carbon compounds that they kind of exude or ooze <laughs> into, the, into the soil. And it, it, that's a fact that doesn't seem to be accounted for very much anywhere. I, I was watching a PBS special a night or two ago, and they were talking about a whole range of things that we might do and might consider to sort of you know mitigate you know global warming and you know amongst those you know geoengineering which is kind of scary and then you know, growing more trees and then whenever they refer to growing more trees they always seem to just refer to the above ground mass of you know how much carbon is in the actual wood and I've never seen any of those 
articles or programs like refer to this carbon going into the soil through the roots. Yeah. And I don't know if, do you know, is, is that true across different kinds of plants like grasses and yeah. perennials, trees? Oh, it is. It's very much true. And like, so it's it's like around a huge here. thing that no one seems to know about. Yeah. Um, around here, when our forests reach about 80 years of age, half the carbon is in the ground. And then the other half is all the biomass you see above ground. After that, there's more and more carbon underground. So by the time we get up to an old growth forest, about 60% of the carbon is in the ground. And it stays there. So these are huge, huge carbon sinks. In, um, in the ground in the form of these yeah, compounds yeah. in the soil, not just like the mass of the roots. No, no. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's all down there. And um, <clears throat> But not only that, <clears throat> it used to be thought when trees reached about 80 years of age, they slowed down their growth rates. Uh, that's why in forestry terminology, you know, trees getting over 80 years of age are called over mature. That's when they should be harvested because they're slowing their growth. Um, in fact, that's not the case at all. Studies happening now at the Harvard Forest, studies done by Bob Leverett, who's like an old growth guru in New England. Um, they're both showing that trees like red oak and white pine continue to accelerate their growth rates up to 200 years of age. <laughs> Um, they are taking like between, let's say, 150 and 200 years. They're taking way more carbon in than a tree between 50 and 100, and way, way more between a tree of, let's say, 20 and 50. They're taking in huge amounts, and a lot of that is getting sequestered in the ground. These studies are showing that our biggest single mitigating factor against climate change would just be to let our forests age. And and if we and that doesn't mean we can't remove forest products, but we got to do it more conservatively because the worst thing we want to do is start doing clear cuts. Because once we do a clear cut, all that carbon in the ground now starts to decompose and is released, and it all comes out. So it's uh, you know if we do more conservative cuts, we're taking a tree here or there, that carbon stays in the ground. But when we do clear cuts. It's all mobilized out. And what people don't realize, they have this idea, well, yeah, the carbon goes out, but then the trees grow and it brings it back in. So it's sort of, you know, zero sum game. It's not like that. It takes 70, it takes a century to pull 70% of that CO2 back out of the atmosphere. It takes a thousand years to get it all out. But you do a clear cut, it's all going up in one year. So it's like, uh, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, um, as part of the work that some of us who do landscaping and some of the other comments of people in the room, I try to take all the things that I've learned from those practices and from no-till ag and apply it to planning and development. Because I sit on a board in our town right now that does that. I'm using tools to explain what you're saying, what we all understand to the public and to the planners and to the administrators. And also developers, because my job in that function is also as an educator. And they they say, oh no, it's much cheaper to go in and clear cut. Whereas we're some of us are advocating, no, 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 keep those trees, keep all the shrubs in the understory and the ground cover, because that is going to make your places actually worth more money, sell faster, rent faster, you retain your tenants longer, you know the rest, etc. So I'm just curious if you have more tools for us out here to. Um, you know, I, I, you're, you're absolutely on the right track. I don't know if I have the tools, but, you know, it'd be great if you had uh, a committee in town that could really just spearhead this stuff and present these things as part of the discussion process because um, make it a bit more formalized, possibly. Uh, but, you know, there are, you know, it isn't well known, but, you know, you can get someone from the Harvard Forest. They're doing all these studies on carbon sequestration in the soil, on trees and things. Um, you can get, they, they come out and talk to public and, and, and planning sessions and stuff, bring them in, you know, they have the expertise. Yeah. Is this uh, also more of a case to target removing bittersweet uh, that's invading certain areas around here that's choking out these larger trees? Yeah, so um, I think it is, you know, uh, with invasive species, um, they're here to stay. We're not going to get rid of them. So we, it's, I look at it like triage. we got to be very strategic in how we work at it. So I think first place, we make sure we keep them out of areas as they're just starting to move in, because they're easy to get rid of and weed them out very quickly if they're just starting. Uh, we make sure we keep them out of uh, unique ecosystems, ecosystems that are rare and endangered species. And then we put our attention as best we can to other areas. But there's going to be some areas we're just going to have to let go, because we just don't have the resources to remove it all. 
But yes, um, doing what we can do does help because that means those trees don't die. Um, and you have, again, all the benefits of having a healthy ecosystem. I know one spot down in Connecticut I came across many years ago. Uh, it was probably about five to 10 acres where the bittersweet had gone up over the trees and killed everything. Everything eventually came down. And in that five to 10 acres, all it was was a mat of vines about six feet high, mm -hmm. nothing else. And so, um, yeah, a problem. But I think I'm getting the cue here. To make it bad enough time. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>